All right. Um, challenging the charismatic gifts of today. There is really a terrible confusion facing believers today, yet that's not the way things ought to be. 1 Corinthians 14.33 tells us, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. This comes in a passage dealing with spiritual gifts, and so it is particularly um, important for our, our study today. All over the world, Christians are being told that they may return to the miraculous gifts of the early church. A recent magazine advertised, finally, a home study course in miracles. If you just needed a miracle, there was a home study course for you. In another article, a visitor to a charismatic meeting reported, the crowd at times seemed to forget how to sing in English. Quote, out of their mouths would come new languages and lovely harmony that no human being could have learned. Again, an advertisement promises you the opportunity of sharing three energizing Holy Ghost joy and healing days. Now, not only do I feel that it is understandably a great lure to many sincere Christians, in fact, if the charismatic gifts of speaking in tongues, of prophesying, of healing are still available to the church, then frankly, you and I ought to be seeking them. <clears throat> the thing is, that's the question, you see. Are these gifts available? Now, our answer must come from the Bible. The Bible is our only authoritative source of information. Experiences that you might have had or not had are only anecdotal, They're just things that happen. It's like finding a penny and just declaring what that means in your life. One lady, uh, every time she saw a cardinal bird, that, um, that meant something. God was saying something special to her. I'm, I'm sure God was saying something special to all of us all the time, but uh, um, making those uh, connection things is, is not, not a wise thing. They don't teach us the truth. The ideas of men do not guarantee truth. How many times have men proclaimed something that has been found to be false? So God gave us truth by speaking through his inspired word. And that's where we need to find our, our, um, to find our truth, to be aware of our truth. Now, we dare not trust our hearts to confirm truth. The world is telling us this, you know, follow your heart. But Jeremiah, wise prophet, speaking to uh, Israel at the time when they were being punished for their turning away from God, he said in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful, your heart, my heart, above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? And so following your heart is not a wise thing. If your heart is trained, you may follow that part of it. But just as it is, you don't want to follow that. So the Bible teaches us that we are sinful in every part. That means we cannot trust our reasoning powers or our loving feelings alone. Sin has stained our every part. This is what the theologians call total depravity. Total depravity doesn't mean that you're as bad as you possibly could be or that anybody is. It means that you are totally Every part of you has been corrupted by sin. So every attempt to rely on self will lead to failure. The Apostle Paul, uh, greatest uh, writer of scripture ever known, um, Romans 7, 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. <clears throat> so I want to share with you then three uh, things dealing with three of the gifts uh, that are being presented today as in full use. The first is the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues, speaking in tongues. I want to present to you first the solid rock evidence, the biblical definition of the gift of tongues. And this we find from Acts 2, 4 to 11. Now it's a long passage, but I want you to follow through 
uh, what had happened is on that day of Pentecost, <clears throat> 50 days after Passover, the Jews were gathered at Jerusalem. And these, uh, earlier it says there might have been as many as 120 of the uh, disciples gathered together in what they called the upper room. <clears throat> Must have been some sort of balcony or something where they could go out there and began to speak. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Here was a gift of the Holy Spirit allowing them to speak with other tongues. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, that had come for the Passover, stayed for Pentecost, out of every nation under heaven. <clears throat> uh, global traffic existed even in those times. It was not as convenient, not as safe as it is today. But uh, we have evidence of um, people from Israel being in, in Mexico, and um, actually a tomb was found in, in Kentucky um, of people that, of the Jewish uh, nation that had traveled over here. So uh, every nation on, under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, people said, hey, do you hear what's going on over here? The multitude came together and were confounded. They didn't know what to make of this because that every man heard them speak in his own language. You say, well, how many languages were there? Okay. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? <laughs> now, that's like saying, these are country bumpkins. These are people that don't, that, you know, have not studied languages. How in the world are they speaking these languages? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. And it starts giving the list, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were speaking of, of testimonies of the wonderful things that God had done probably creation, and work of salvation, and so on. The question we want to ask here is to be specific, what was the source of the gift? Well, verse 4 told us they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. <clears throat> Some have said this was a gift that was given to the audience to hear these words in their own language, but this was not the gift of hearing. It was the gift of speaking, you see. And the Spirit gave them utterance, the ability to speak. So this work, make no mistake, came from the Holy Spirit. The biblical gift was bestowed fully by the Spirit. <clears throat> you see this connection. Last week we were talking about some of these things. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 11. But the manifestation of the Spirit, making the Spirit known is given to every man to profit with all. But all these worketh that one and self same spirit. All of the different gifts are worked by the same Holy Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. It is his decision, it is his um, work to uh, give these gifts. So the Spirit gave them power to emphasize the Spirit's power. They were speaking a language that these people had not studied. They did not know these languages. As I say, they were Galileans, most of them. So they were, they were fishermen. There were people who lived uh, out in the country areas. So um, they were not gifted uh, li linguists. So this was a supernatural gift, and that was the point of these spiritual gifts. So we must not think the gift of speaking in tongues is merely a natural human ability somehow controlled by the Spirit. It is a gift from the Spirit enabling a person to do something that would be impossible without the Spirit's work. Verse 11 says the Holy Spirit distributed to each just as he chose. There are some people today trying to teach believers to speak in tongues by priming the pump. I know this personally because of a, a, a dear friend of mine 
who uh, grew up with us. He was younger. He was actually my, my youngest brother's uh, close friend. But he really got off in, into wrong areas of life. But then he went to a tent meeting where uh, they showed a film, and the fellow said, now, uh, in a moment, we're going to have you speak in tongues. And he was all nervous because he didn't know how to do that. And the fellow said, now, don't worry. He says, um, this is something that you can do, but you have to prime the pump. And what he meant by that was he had to do these certain things. So uh, priming the pump meant breathing hard. He says, they heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind. He says, what that means is they were sitting around breathing hard. So I had everybody start breathing hard, hyperventilating. Chanting a phrase or a chorus over and over again, or practicing speaking gibberish. Now, my brothers and I practice speaking gibberish. We just found it's something you can do. You don't have to think much about it. Just go, ah, no, no. I, in fact, we did this standing in line at uh, JFK's um, uh, eternal uh, flame uh, grave there in Washington area. And um, so we were standing there, and, and the people in front of us were, you know, Arabs or something, and people behind us were for another nation. So we looked at each other, and we went, and we just started gibbering, you know. And uh, so you can just do that. I mean, uh, I, I sort of do that when I yawn. I, I, I thought it was kind of a boring thing to just say, ho hum. So I take that big breath, breath of yawning in, and I say, ah, oh, look at it. But anyway, uh, it doesn't mean anything. It is not gibberish. The Bible says the true gift of speaking in tongues was not a human ability brought to the front, but instead a miraculous gift controlled by the Holy Spirit. What was the source of the gift? God working miraculously by the Holy Spirit. Now let me get to the point here, the thing that reveals that this modern so-called speaking in tongues is not the Holy Spirit gift. Tongues as actual language. That's all we can understand from this. The great miracle of Acts 2 is that the disciples spoke in languages that they had never learned. A foreign language. So, as I say earlier, Acts 1.15, 120 disciples had gathered together. So it might have been as many as that. They were meeting together on the day of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, they spoke in languages clearly understood by the multitude. Now, the audience marveled that the Galileans, who were noted for their imprecise speech, were suddenly able to speak all the languages of the places listed there that we went through in verses 9 to 11. The miracle was <clears throat> that they spoke perfectly the foreign languages of the world. In other words, it's, it's hard for us to hear somebody with a, 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 a deep accent uh, speaking English or whatever, you know, uh, they were able to understand these people. And this is the first time they ever spoke in Arabic or whatever it was. But they were speaking it perfectly. So we see that Jews had come for this great feast from as far away as Babylon, as far south as Egypt, as far west as Rome, to celebrate the Jewish feast of Pentecost. And they each heard them speak the language to which they were born. So therefore, this cannot be ecstatic speech or meaningless gibberish. It cannot be that. If a so-called gift of tongues that is being exercised today does not result in an actual foreign language spoken by people who do not know the language, then it is not the Pentecostal gift of tongues. It fails the essential test of being a gift of the Spirit. Now, there are some then who argue for their experience by saying that the scripture does teach that the gift involved ecstatic speech, gibberish. And here's their arguments. And I think you're going to see that this is not, these are kind of specious. These are, they're not a very good, um, good argument from the scripture. But they claim Acts 2.13 shows the speakers sounded drunk. So somebody slurring the language because they're drunk uh, that could sound like speaking in the Spirit. See. But verses 6 to 11 clearly list actual foreign languages. Now, they heard others speaking languages that were unknown to them. 
So um, you have perhaps up to 120 of these disciples speaking, and evidently all of them are speaking different languages, or, or several of them are speaking different languages. So the guy down here from Egypt, he could hear two, three, maybe, speaking his language, but all the rest were speaking languages he didn't understand. And so the person over here from Babylon would hear them speak in his language, but all the rest of them were speaking another language. So in derision, they claimed that the disciples were drunk. So this is pure mockery. This is not a reasoned response. Because no drunken person has a greater ability of language. And as Peter reminded them, it was only 9 o'clock in the morning. So he says, even stalwart drinkers here won't, won't be drunk by 9 o'clock in the morning. There's another argument. Others claim that when 1 Corinthians 2.10 and other verses mention the gift of interpretation of tongues, it means it demands that only ecstatic speech would demand an interpretation. In other words, if it was a real language, somebody would understand it. Well, that's not exactly always the truth. Instead, the need for interpretation came from the Corinthians who brought the gift of foreign languages into the church. So, of course, Pastor Emiru has brought foreign languages into the church, but he's speaking to people who speak Amharic language. Um, if he speaks to the rest of us, he speaks in English, you see. Uh, it doesn't help us at all to hear him speak in Amharic, as it really helps those who their native language is, is Amharic. So the congregation there did not understand the foreign languages that were being spoken by the gift of tongues. So God graciously gave them interpretations. God wanted it to make some sense for the people of the church. So the gift of speaking in tongues was never redefined. After Acts 2, there's no redefinition of speaking in tongues. That was then, this is now, nothing like that. It was not gibberish, but actual foreign languages spoken perfectly, though unknown by the speaker. These words were coming out as though they knew the language, but they didn't know it. The tongues is, is the actual word for tongue, the gloss, the glossalia. But we say that today, spoke with a foreign tongue, spoke with another tongue. Uh, it always refers to language, real language. A test was made. A Hebrew scholar, Dr. Charles Finberg, Feinberg, once recorded uh, on tape uh, a charismatic speecher's ecstatic speech. He was just there listening. He then went home, duplicated the tape, and mailed it to several charismatics asking for the interpretation. So if it was a language that he didn't know, although he was a Hebrew scholar, um, Maybe somebody would know it, and maybe it was a divine language of some kind that these people would, would have the gift of interpretation. Now, all of those who responded showed no consistency of translation. You understand that if I were to, uh, if you were to record me speaking uh, a verse of scripture in German, and then you took it to German-speaking people, they might change a word or two or have a different emphasis but it would be the same message because the words carry a certain message. Well, everybody that responded to him showed no consistency of translation, entirely different messages. It was not various versions of the same message. It was completely different meanings. The conclusion is that the ecstatic speech actually gave no information. It carried no message. In fact, this thing of interpretation, uh, Dr. Feinberg himself once rose in a charismatic meeting to illustrate the point, and he spoke in a foreign language. He was actually speaking Hebrew, and he was quoting the 23rd Psalm. Another man stood with an interpretation. I have an interpretation, he said. And he started talking about, you know, we ought to love one another and whatever. So Dr. Feinberg stood up and contradicted him by re revealing that he had quoted the 23rd Psalm in Hebrew. And I think it's quite revealingly that the church did not throw out the false interpreter, he threw out Dr. Feinberg. You troublemaker. So. Uh, 
this thing is not real. What they're doing, it feels good. It is spurred by an emotional outburst. Um, one man, after talking to him for a while, he said, well, I don't, I don't care what you say. He said, uh, the Bible is like having your cake, but the speaking in tongues is like having icing on your cake. So, uh, you know, that made it clear that he wasn't interested in the truth. He was just interested in how it made him feel. What then was God's purpose for tongues? We actually dealt with this last week, but let me go into it in a little more detail. What was the purpose of tongues? What did the Spirit desire to accomplish by giving this gift? Perhaps it's obvious by the way it was used in Acts chapter 2, but let us lay a foundation for later instruction. The content of their speech was what? In verse 11, it was the wonderful works of God. They were giving a testimony of reasons to glorify God for one of his wonderful works. The effect of their words was that the gathered crowd stayed because they just heard a supernatural thing happen, but they stayed to hear the plain words of Peter's sermon. Peter didn't get up and preach his sermon in, in a various degrees of gibberish and other languages. He spoke in the Greek that everybody understood. 1 Corinthians 14.22 explains that tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. There's an evangelistic purpose in this. This is the way that a person could come into a, a place where they had their own native language and begin to speak in that language, though he was not a native. That was a supernatural gift, and the people said, this thing is from God, or from one of the gods, you know, depending on what they believed. And then, in the common language, he would speak of the gospel of Christ. The purpose of the gift, then, is to attract attention of the unsaved by an indisputable miracle, and to give the believers an opportunity to preach the gospel than in the common language. Paul clearly used tongues for this purpose. In 1 Corinthians 14, 18, and 19, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. That was his job. He was a missionary. He was going to all these foreign places. Yet in the church, by distinction, I had rather speak five words with my understanding than by my voice that by my voice I might teach others also, rather than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. I was speaking a foreign language that you don't understand, and that's not going to help you at all. So I'd rather speak five words that all of us can understand together. And as I said last week, he had that choice. These things were not, you, you, you know, you weren't given a gift and you just had to stand up and blurt it out. It was a message given to you, and then you could share it, or not. So the emphasis here is that though he used the gift of tongues very often, he never used it in the church. It didn't fit the purpose of the church, which was not actually to evangelize, because these were saved people who were gathering in the church. It was to educate, to edify, to build them up. The church, he explains, was for building strong Christians. The purpose of the church was perfecting the saints, according to Ephesians 4.12. Perfecting, building them up, maturing them. While Paul did not forbid tongues in the church, because that was a true gift given by God at the time, he did limit it in the church as he did no other gift. I mentioned some of these last time. 1 Corinthians 17, 27, 14, 27 to 28. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, a foreign tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, meaning one at a time. <clears throat> so he says in the entire service. I don't want 20 people up there speaking and all at the same time. This is where he comes in with that verse I mentioned earlier, that God's not the author of confusion. He says, you just do it one by, turn, one, by one, and let one interpret. Oh, well, not all the time do we have an interpreter. Well, he says, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. So he can enjoy the gift, knowing that God's doing something special with him, but he's just praying 
praying to God and using this language, knowing that he's saying something important, even though he doesn't understand it. So he limited the speaking not only by time, but also to the males of the church. 1 Corinthians 14.34, in the context of speaking in tongues, let your women keep silence in the church, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. They may be given the gift, but he says it's not for them to speak in the church. You can debate that in some other way, but this is what he says. So the purpose of speaking in tongues had nothing to do with edifying believers or, or even make, making them feel good. It was a sign miracle to point others to the gospel. So we do find, to be complete, one additional purpose of tongues found in the book of Acts. God used it as a sign to the Jew that others could receive salvation in Christ, just like the Jew. The Jew first, then the rest of the world. God used it to bring the Jews and the Samaritans together as Christians. What happened is that because of persecution, the Christians fled out of Jerusalem. They went down to Samaria to begin speaking of the gospel and what, Christ, what their witness had been of Christ's death and his resurrection. And they were winning people to the Lord. Well, what was happening there, things got stalled because when the people got saved, normally they spoke in tongues, which was kind of God saying, yes, this is a miracle, miracle that happened, and they get to be included. But these Samaritans weren't speaking in tongues. And so the people said, I don't know, are we doing something wrong? So they sent up to Jerusalem, and the apostles came down, and they then laid hands on these believers, and when they laid hands on them, they began to speak in the foreign language. This was the Samaritans, who had this kind of a racial diversion from the from the pure Jews of Jerusalem, because um, they were they were Jews who had intermarried with the Gentiles of Samaria. This was showing that that laying on of hands is is a thing of fellowship, a thing of of blessing, and so when they were blessed of these pure Jewish believers, they received the gift. And uh, God said, the church is one group. It is not Jew and Gentile, not Jew and Samaritan, <clears throat> but one, one people. So much with the gift of tongues. Let's look, secondly, at the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy was a very important gift in the early church. It helped to build the church before the scriptures were completed. Ephesians 2.20, I says that um, the truth of God was built upon the foundation of the apostles, that's the, the 12, and prophets. Now, this is not Old Testament prophets. They didn't speak concerning the church. But the apostles and prophets, these were the New Testament prophets. These were the people that God gave a gift to speak in the common language, a message that he had for them. So Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone is how he ends the church has Christ as the cornerstone, but it was built up by the apostles, preaching in their normal language, and the prophets giving God's revelation, new revelation, uh, in the common tongue. Now, notice the distinction between prophecy and tongues used in the church. In 1 Corinthians 14, he points out that the two gifts are similar in that they both involve speaking as a result of God's gift. Both gifts put God's words in the mouth of the speaker. But the essential difference is that the gift of tongues was not understood by the people of the church, while the gift of prophecy was. We understand then that the gift of prophecy was the ability to speak the words of God in the common language of the majority. The gift of tongues was the ability to speak the words of God in a foreign language. Now, because... The person says, I've been given a message, and they would stand and speak. There was no, no litmus test. There was no guarantee that what they were saying actually came from God. This is the important thing we need to recognize. There was a question, there was a possibility that they could just fake it. That maybe they just got tired of sitting there by themselves, and they said, okay, I have a message. 
And then they just said something they thought was a good, good idea. But 1 Corinthians 12, 2 and 3. You know that you were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb, unspeaking idols, even as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking of the Spirit of God calleth God accursed or anathema. He says, that doesn't come from the Spirit of God. And that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, Master, but by the Holy Ghost. So some, evidently, had actually spoken blasphemy, saying this was a message of God. Well, he says it's not true, nor should they be believed. And so uh, even then, what was called the gift of prophecy had to be judged by what they already knew from the word of God to be true. Let me close then with this third gift, and that's the gift of healing. We hear a lot about that today. Now, what was the genuine gift? Well, the miracles of healing that were true gifts of the Spirit were unquestionably supernatural. We had a person who was born blind. Christ was able to restore his sight. And amazingly, not only did he restore his sight, he understood what he saw. There was a, a link, a connection there, uh, like a, automatic knowledge that was given to him as well. Let me take, however, the first example of healing in the history of the early church. This from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Here's the story. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. So the ninth hour, <clears throat> they uh, uh, went to the time of prayer and went to the temple. Still in existence at that time. A certain man, lame from his mother's womb. This is a man that had never walked. He didn't, he, I don't know if he, if he crawled, but it, he uh, never was able to walk. He was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms, to ask charity of them that entered the temple. Well, you're going to get some of the best people going to prayer time at the temple. And so maybe they would say, um, yes, I, I have a, a, I feel bad for this man who can't walk. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask and alms. Could you help me support myself? And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. Now he's saying, what? Why do you want me to look at you then? See? But such as I have give I unto thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. This is Dr. Luke recording this. And he, he, his medical training, he says, this is how he could do this. Feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Now the reason I chose this miracle is that uh, Acts 4.22 tells us the man was over 40 years old and had never walked, never taken a step. I want you to be with me now, and, and his loins are wrapped with some cloth, but what do you suppose his impotent legs look like? Those are like, you know, the strand of spaghetti with a knot tied in the middle where the, where the knee is, you know. It had no strength, had no, no muscle, had no, it was just skinny little worthless legs. So the physician, Luke, says immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength because they had never supported his weight. Now, after that, what do you suppose the legs look like? I wonder if they just like a skinny balloon, got inflated a bit. Now there's some muscle in there to hold it. Maybe not. But um, but he had the, the strength to do that. And I want you to notice the other part of the miracle, and that is he never had to learn to walk. And leaping up, he walked and entered into the miracle, walking, leaping, praising God. 
it, a man who never had walked, never learned to walk, suddenly knew how, as well as had the leg ability. So the man who never learned to walk, now walked. He did not crawl and totter and learn to balance himself. He leaped to a standing position and walked. This was an amazing miracle that could not be explained by you know, him, a rush of adrenaline. When the enemies of the gospel broke up the gathering, they wanted to contradict what had been said but, and done, but they could not. Here's what they're thinking. Acts 4.16 saying, What shall we do unto these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all of them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. We would like to deny it, but we can't. Now, when he mentioned those that dwell in Jerusalem, because at that time there were still the the thousands upon thousands that came from all around the world. But <clears throat> dwell in Jerusalem has reference to the ones who actually um, lived there, often went to the temple at the time of prayer, and they knew this man, always sitting at the, the gate, beautiful. All right, that's the real thing. That's how it worked. Let's look and close with the pretended gift. Today we find false healers who put walking visitors in wheelchairs so that it will appear to others that the lame are made to walk. I tell you this because I have a friend, who's now dead, but uh, a friend, Gene Keeney of Indianapolis. And uh, he was telling me he had a chronic ache in his back and hip. And ever so often it would get so painful. He went to the chiropractor once and, and the pain was so great, he, he, he just got upset. He picked up a table and kind of shoved it around, they, they pulled him off to the side. But uh, the pain was just so great. Well, he had some friends who were believing in the faith healer, and they begged him to try the faith healer. He'd come to the big tent. So he says, well, it'd be a little time off my day, but uh, it'd be great if I got healed. So he pulled up, he got out of his car, began to walk to the tent, uh, you know, bent over, halting and so on, and workers from the place, they came up to him with wheelchairs. Now, these wheelchairs all had a certain mark on them, a certain painting job that identified them as their wheelchairs. And they had him sit, and he said, well, thank you, you know. Well, they brought him in. They rolled him right up to the front row. They asked, uh, and, and um, so when, when the healer stepped up, he looked over, he knew something that nobody else knew, and that this was their wheelchair, so the guy didn't bring his own wheelchair. He had walked until they found him and put him in a wheelchair. But the healer called attention to Gene, spoke of Gene's problem as a walking problem. Now he had to agree with that, because certainly having a bad back and hip gave him a walking problem. But he asked him to stand up and come to him. So he did, painfully, stepped a couple of steps and got up. And the man just stopped right there and looked around, you know, victory at last. Here's the man who couldn't walk, has walked. Well, he could walk. As a professional magician, Gene Keeney uh, told me this deception was not lost on him. He saw a trick when he, when he knew it. He knew a trick when he saw it. This charlatan did not help Gene. He had to go back and get a chiropractor to work on him. Now, often people with back aches and other nondescript pains are supposedly healed by these hypnotic speakers who <coughs> causing an audience emotions to run high, and finally they talk to them and they strike them on the forehead and so on uh, and, and the adrenaline rushes in and they overcome weakness. The chanting and repetitive singing works to lower cognitive understanding, raise the expectations of the miraculous, but the true healings of the church were unmistakably miracles from God. Now, one of the radio preachers pronounced on his program 
that one day he visited a hospital and he said, by the time we were done, we had nearly emptied the hospital. Well, the man listening to him was a dedicated Christian and a person who suspected that he was not telling the truth, and so he actually went to that hospital. It was out of state for him, but he went to that hospital and said, I'm checking up on, and uh, on this date, uh, this man said he was there, and he healed so many people that the hospital was nearly empty. Well, in talking to them, the doctors remembered the man's visit and all the commotion and other things that it caused, but it said that otherwise it was a normal day at the hospital and nobody walked out healed. The man made it up. I mean, if you were a, a, a faith healer that could just touch people and make them healed, well, then that probably would have happened, you know. You could have nearly cleared out the hospital. It just did not happen. The man lied on his broadcast, assuming what? That nobody would take the time to check up on his claims. One man did and found that he was, in fact, a liar as well as a a pretender, a charlatan. Let me say to you that we do not have, you know, a special prejudice to talk bad about these people. What I'm saying is what they're doing is not what the Bible says are those spiritual gifts. They are claiming to do something that might get people to feel good, but it's not the miraculous work of speaking in tongues, an actual foreign language. It is not the work of prophesying, actually giving the re revealed word of God. Some of these guys are talking about prophecy they received. They tell you how tall God is, what color hair he has, you know, about how much he weighs, um, what planet he lives on. I mean, seriously. This is what they're, what they're saying. They got a message from God about this. This is not from God. This doesn't fit into the word of God at all. And they're not healing people. They're not healing people. Uh, the people have to keep coming back. And, and, you know, and the answer is, well, if it failed, you didn't have enough faith. It's not me. It's you. You're the problem. And this is, um, this is a horrible thing. Uh, man, the man who actually went to that hospital and checked it out, Hank Hennegraff, uh, wrote a book called uh, uh, Crisis of Christianity. And he said there's so many people deceived in this thing, and these guys are making millions of dollars from people who are hoping for God to bless them. Um, this is just criminal. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your true gift, the gift of salvation, the gift of the your son Jesus and we thank you for the true gifts of the Holy Spirit but father these as we'll talk about later have been removed from by you because there's no need for them to establish the miraculous to authenticate the words being spoken now we ask father that you might help us then to trust you in this and to realize that though we might think it fun and interesting and and uh, full of faith to believe these things. They're actually false teachers, and they're there to take, to shear the sheep rather than to feed them. We pray thy blessing then upon us as we trust in your word above the word of men, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.